are coming from traditional financial services companies. They're all upstarts, challengers, startups, disruptors that are moving into the, uh, to the financial services space. And the financial services companies are really struggling to keep up with this. They've got decades of legacy technology. They have very traditional product-centered business thinking instead of customer-centered business thinking. Uh, and they have very look-alike products. I mean, you can go to almost any bank and get a very similar kind of product. So big financial institutions are really struggling to keep up with these innovators. And you know, it's not just financial services. This is just supposed to represent any large corporation. Um, Everybody knows that large companies have trouble with this. You were innovative when you were small, you had a new product or a new service, or you cracked into a new market. But as you got bigger, you developed silos and bureaucracies and hierarchy. And everybody's incentive on keeping today's operational model more efficient, just cutting costs out and getting more efficient what we do. Hardly anybody's incentive to stick their neck out and try something different. And that, that's the problem for big enterprises. The problem is this oncoming wave that's about ready to sweep over you is the accelerating rate of business change. And everybody knows it's ex getting exponentially faster every year, and there's no way it's going to slow down. So this is a real challenge for big organizations. On the one hand, they're slow, they're cumbersome, it's difficult for them to change. On the other hand, the actual rate of business change is, is speeding up and speeding up and speeding up more every year. And most big companies are not dealing well with this. And I just want to give you some statistics. These are mainly out of North America. Um, since 1965, the rate of return on assets, which is actually a better indication than, than profitability by itself, like how much are you getting back from the assets you've invested, has declined since 1965 for US companies by 65%. Okay, way down the hill. Um, the life expectancy of firms on the, on the U.S. Fortune 500 was 67 years. That's how the average lifespan on the Fortune 500 was just five decades ago. Now it's down to less than 15 years and is rapidly headed towards five. The life of an average business model today is down to about eight years. So if you're not thinking, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to change my business model three years or four years or five years from now? And maybe you're only a three, four year old company. You're in serious trouble. 80%, and this is a global statistic, 80% of all the goods, new products and services that are introduced in the market every year will not survive to see your third birthday. So less than three years. 80% of products and services fail within three years. This is a challenge for, for big corporations. And of course, technology change is driving a lot of this. Um, these are statistics. I went to the Gardner IT Expo at the end of last year. These are statistics that came out of a, a number of studies that Gardner's done. 71% of CEOs, not CIOs, but chief executive officers of corporations now believe that technology change is the single biggest challenge they have to deal with. Gardner predicts that the architectures of the last 20 years will not survive in, in, in the next period. In other words, what got you here is not going to get you there. Market leaders in mobile and cloud services weren't even on the radar five years ago. So consider the fact that Apple and Samsung now, now account for over 90% of the profits in the mobile device market. They weren't even in that market five years ago. And we all know what happened to Nike and Blackberry. By 2017, that's only three years from now, 80% of technology spend is going to be on consumer devices, not big iron not networks on consumer devices. And by 2020, six years from now, you're going to have the opportunity of having over 500 smart devices inside your home. This is radical technology change. Just a couple of quotable quotes. Mark Andreessen, who wrote the first web browser, is now a big angel investor in technology startups. Software is even the world. And even a company like FedEx, you know, they're a logistics company, trucks and planes moving stuff around. Vice President, Senior Vice President of FedEx says now every company is a software company. So technology change is closely associated with this rapid business change that we're seeing. It's no surprise that on Forbes' list of the five most innovative companies in the world, four of them are technology companies, where technology is the business. So 
With that background in mind, what I want to be talking about for the bulk of the talk is that if you're in a major company, there's three levels of innovation you have to be concerned about. And you have to be working on every one of these levels at all times. It's not like you can concentrate on one while you pick the other ones. You constantly have to be working on these. And that's business model innovation. What kind of, what's the shape of my business? What business am I in? What products and services am I offering? How do I manage my business? Do I need to be concerned about uh, innovating in that area? And then lastly, product and service innovation. If 80% of products in the marketplace don't survive for more than three years, how do I be able to, to put innovate on the product and service level of the so the first one we're going to look at is business model innovation. Now, clearly, a lot of companies are not dealing well with this. You know, we all know the big spectacular bankruptcies in the last few years, and Kodak kind of gets talked to death. But I just want to remind you that Kodak could see it coming for 40 years. They invented, invented digital photography. It's not like they didn't know about it. They invented digital photography in 1975. The problem was they just couldn't let go of their old business model, which was based on film, uh, not digital. So, you know, right after the time they declared bankruptcy, that, that was the problem. Um, borders, you know, bookstores really struggling these days. And down the right hand side, I've got a, a whole bunch of newspapers. I, I don't know the, the ones in Latin America, but uh, if you're in the newspaper business, you need to rethink what business you're in. You're in the information business, uh, you're not in the newspaper business anymore because that's not going to survive. So Jeff Moore, the guy who wrote Crossing the Chasm, came out with another book a couple of years ago called Escape Velocity, where he says the hardest thing in the world for a big corporation is escaping the gravitational pull of last year's operating plan. So he can really get into creating new product and service categories like the iPad. I'll talk more about Apple in a minute. Now, I don't know how many people have heard or read of the business model canvas. We didn't invent it. A few people have. We didn't invent it, but we use it and similar models a lot with our customers to help them do two things. Both understand and break down the components of their existing business model, like customer relationships and customer segmentation and what's your value proposition, your cost structure, and your revenue streams. And also then to use that to reimagine what a future business model for your business might look like. So if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go take a look at it. There's a lot of information on the web. Management model innovation. Gary Hamble, who I'm going to come back to, he uh, teaches at Harvard Business School. He's published, um, you know, he's one of his business gurus, publishes lots of books, and he's been published in the Harvard Business Review more times than any other living author. Says that management model innovation may, in fact, be more important than business model innovation. Because, particularly in the digital era, a new business model is very easy to copy. You know, I, 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 and, and, you know, there's a lot of firms around the world that are looking at a leader, like in the taxi industry, an Uber or something, and simply copying that business model into their own, uh, either the people who are or in their own uh, jurisdiction for Uber as present. So Hamill suggests that maybe business model innovation, actually the way we manage and run the business, may be more important, in fact, than, than business model innovation. So in the show of hands, who knows who that guy is? Okay, that's Frederick Winslow Taylor, uh, who wrote the book on modern management theory, and it really hasn't changed, the way we run our businesses really hasn't changed that much since he published the book in 1911 called Scientific Management. He was a peer of people like Henry Ford and Andrew Carnegie and Andrew Mellon and J. Pierpart Morgan. When modern scientific management, uh, how we run our businesses, was being shaped up mainly in, in, in the United States. And the basic premise of scientific management was uh, pretty simple. The workers, I mean, sorry, the bosses, the management team, does all of the thinking and planning, and the workers do what they're told to do. That might have worked in a manufacturing era, but in an era, in an era where 80% of the value of the products and services that we're producing for the modern economy aren't, uh, isn't composed out of the plastics or the steel or the raw materials that went into that product, it's the intellectual property that went into that product that's most of the value. So in an era where knowledge work becomes more and more important, people are not going to put up with that. The best and the brightest are not going to work in conditions where, you know, where they're just told what to do and, and are responsible for thinking. So John Cotter teaches at Harvard Business School. He's written over 17 books on organizational change. He's probably the leading uh, writer of the on organizational change in the world. 
um, recently came up with this kind of diagram to illustrate the kind of change. That on the left hand side, you see the traditional hierarchy that exists in most corporations. You, know, you get executive managers and managers and managers underneath them, and then finally the workers down at the bottom doing all the work. So that's not going to last, that's not going to make it. We're going to need to go to a model that's much more networked, where people can come together that may be a little bit bored with the day's business model, may be a little bit bored with existing products and services, and can voluntarily network with them and are allowed and empowered to do that inside the organization so they can work on new ways of doing things. But switching from that hierarchy, which is a very traditional management organization, to that kind of network organization, very difficult and very challenging for managers to kind of let go and let that happen. And by the way, it doesn't mean that there isn't a role for management, what he calls the guiding coalition, who sort of set major objectives like, um, you know, this is the date we've got to have a new product in, so we've got to be in market for the Christmas rush, or this is all the budget we've got, guys, you know, so we've got to stay within that budget. But otherwise, empower the teams underneath them, the people at the coal base with the customers, serving the customers, empower them to make the decisions about how the products and the services are going to be developed, because they know better. They're talking to the customers every day. Senior management typically is not. So I don't know if people know about Dan Pink's book called Drive. Uh, there's a lot of motivational literature out there that reaches a very similar conclusion to Pink's um, about what motivates knowledge work. And he says, once you satisfy their basic financial needs, you know, like you know you want to make a decent living, you don't want to feel like you could be, you know, taken advantage of working for an employer. But once they feel like they're being treated fairly financially, a whole new set of motivators kick in. In what he calls intrinsic motivators, i.e., things that come from within, not that are imposed upon them externally by the, by the extrinsic environment. And then he kind of sums those factors up as the desire for autonomy mastery and purpose. Autonomy, I don't want to feel like somebody's standing over me every minute telling me what to do. Mastery, whatever my craft is, I want to feel like I'm getting better at it every single day. And finally, purpose, I want to feel like I'm part of an organization that's achieving something more than just making profits or putting a, you know, next month's paycheck in my pocket. I want to feel like I'm part of a larger vision, a larger purpose for the organization. And if you are in a company that doesn't provide that kind of environment that can enable you to, to uh, enjoy the final mastery and purpose, you're looking for another job. And employers that don't provide that kind of environment are going to be the employers that fail. So I mentioned Gary Hamill before on this issue of purpose. At the, at the height of the global financial crisis in 2009, he took 50 of the world's most, um, what he considered, globally most innovative CEOs and a bunch of McKinsey strategy consultants away for a three-day retreat, I think it was in Northern California. And the objective they set themselves was to say, let's come up with the 25 moon, what they called moonshots for management. What are the 25 things that are going to be different about 21st century management than was the case in 20th century management? And interestingly enough, the number one recommendation that these people came up with was modern cor corporations are going to have to repurpose themselves. Because maximizing shareholder value, which has been the mantra of 19th to 20th century management, just isn't going to make it as a motivator for really smart and really smart people. And I've used this example at a whole bunch of conferences over the past couple of years. And I usually ask for a show of hands. Let me see people, let me like raise your hand if what gets you jazzed and excited and motivated or any of your peers to come to work every day is it really about maximizing shareholder value. Show of hands. <laughs> See, I mean, nobody's ever put their hand up. I mean, imagine if I was addressing a group of CEOs, it might be a little different because they actually get paid based on that. For, for most of us, it's just not enough. You know, I'm just not going to stay awake nights wondering whether the shareholders in my company are getting rich. That's not what really motivates me. So modern corporations are going to have to think about how do they repurpose their very, the reason they exist. Big challenge. And now we come down to product and service innovation. So for those of you who work in the field of innovation or have read about it, I know that you know it's really difficult to come up with a graphic image that captures the innovation process. Now, usually it's something really corny, like a, a, a light bulb breaking <laughs> up or sparks flying out of somebody's head. Um, and I chose to show a lab experiment to illustrate what I think is really crucial to innovation and that is a, a spirit of experimentation. 
there's kind of a myth that innovation is all art and no science. I don't believe that. I believe we can apply the scientific method to the process of innovation. Because what do you do in science? You have a hypothesis, and then you run some tests to try to figure out is that hypothesis valid or not. And then you may have to run some more experiments. But that's what the scientific method is. And I believe, and I'm going to, the rest of the talk is kind of about this, how do you apply the scientific method to the process of innovation? So Steve Jobs is going to be remembered for lots of things, uh, not least of which he was a real son of a bitch to work for. <laughs> But one of the things he probably won't be remembered for is that when he came back to Apple the second time as CEO, he cut the, the R&D product line down from over 300 different products they were working on to less than 30. He eliminated waste, he, he did less, and he focused the organization. As a result of that kind of focus, they've got the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. Live like that. Just do less. Fortunately, in software, there's a lot of opportunity to do less because we actually produce a lot of waste. And you may have seen this chart before. It's from the Scandish group. A lot of people cite it. That 64% of the functionality in modern business software is seldom or never used. Think about Word or Excel. I know that there are, and you probably do too, that there are hundreds of functions in Word and Excel that I just, I, they may be there. I don't know why. I never use them. In fact, and it's not just us, Microsoft gets hundreds of requests every year for features and functionality that's already there. <laughs> and, and we know why it happens like this. And if you want a longer explanation, see me afterwards. But the short answer is it's the way we gather requirements. So the IT department comes to the business department and says, OK, tell me everything you want in the system and get it right the first time. Because if you change your mind later, that's a change request. I'm going to have to charge you more money. So the business tries. They spew out everything, every feature they could possibly think about. We then go off in the IT department and write that stuff up. And that's what happens. Most of the features and functionality weren't actually required. If we just didn't do that, we'd save 60% of our costs. So focus, do less, don't build features that nobody's ever going to use. So Naji and Tuck did a study of hundreds of companies in terms of how they actually organize their investments, or what they call how they manage their, their I portfolio. And what's it, what they talked about was three different levels, uh, three different elements in your, in your portfolio. Core, uh, you know, your core business where you're optimizing your existing products or you're, you know, you're trying to improve a little bit the product you're selling to your existing customers. Adjacent, now that's new business. It's not something you're doing today. But it's not that much different. You know, you sort of you feel pretty safe when you move the adjacent area. And then transformation, you know, really breakthrough products and services, or we're actually creating a market that didn't, didn't even exist before. And of course, Apple is well known for, for uh, I think, on both of those kinds of things, like really breakthrough transformational um, innovation. I mean, nobody ever asked for an iPod. Nobody ever asked for an iPad. Um, nobody asked for that, but nobody asked for an iPod. So uh, they were breakthrough innovations. And in this study, they looked at how most companies distribute their, their uh, innovation investment dollars. And not surprisingly, about 70% of it goes on today's, you know, just tweaking today's existing products and services. About 20% goes into that adjacent area, new business, but it's something you're pretty familiar with. And about 10% goes into that, uh, that out there, you know, three years from that kind of transformation. But interestingly enough, when they looked at how high performance companies did, um, that is, companies that were outperforming the average index in their industry. They found out that the return on investment from those innovation dollars was, was inversely proportional uh, to, the, to, to, to what the investment was. So 70% of the profits were coming out of the transformational uh, investments. 20% of the profits were coming out of adjacent, and only 10% were coming out of core. So again, you know, most companies don't do this, but you've got to think about where are you going to get at the curve? Are you, are you trying to think where you, your company needs to be in 18 or 24 or 36 months, not just next month? But I'll, I'll talk sort of towards the end of this talk about how short-term thinking driven by Wall Street has ruined a lot of the companies. So I want to give you an example of innovation in the retail industry. And it's Burberry's. Uh, uh, last, no, a year ago in November, they relaunched their flagship store at 121 Regent Street in, in London. Um, 
just so, before I show you the video about the, the new store, I just want to give you a background on Burberry's. Uh, 150-year-old British luxury brand, iconic, everybody knows about them. But when Angela Rent was brought in as the new CEO in 2006, Burberry's was in real trouble. Nobody was buying French coats. I mean, young people just thought it was an old style brand that, you know, good for grandpa, you know, but, but I don't want to buy one. Most of the sales in their stores were third-party low-margin accessories uh, that they were on, they were on selling, they weren't even their products. So um, stock, stock prices in the toilet. So Arendt went into trying to reinvigorate and re, re, reimagine the brand. But within two years, she was hit by two things. One, the 2008 global financial crisis, the worst uh, decline in consumer spending in 65 years. And secondly, what she called, I think she was the first person to use the term, the digital tsunami. All of her competitors were investing heavily online. So, Burberry's responded by making a huge investment in digital. And then they got around to thinking about uh, relaunching the store, the, the flagship store in London. Now, when most omni-channel retailers think about, you know, the digital channel or the mobile channel, they think, how can I make those, the cheap experience in those channels similar to the experience in the in-store experience so that I get consistencies across the channels? Burberry completely flipped that on its head. They said, we think our digital assets are so awesome. How can we make the in-store experience look, look like and feel like the digital experience? And I just want to play this video to show you what that's like. It's an awesome experience, um, great innovation, 500 screens, and then it almost has like another sort of five, uh, 500 speakers, so surround sound kind of experience, 100 interactive screens. When you pick up a trench coat and put it on, the mirror in front of you, you can stand on right each of it, it turns into a video about that coat, about the quality of the wool that was used, the craftsmanship of the tailors who made it, the heritage and the legacy of the coat. Awesome. But what do you notice about that thing? You probably had to spend tens of millions of pounds to rebuild that store to figure out how the experience would work. Because you couldn't test that kind of thing in terms of building. I mean, this is a big surround sound experience, you know, visual and sound experience. You couldn't test that kind of thing in the usability lab. So very, very impressive innovation, but very risky, because that might not have worked. When Apple launched its retail stores, the company is with such a precarious financial position. I heard the CEO of Aiding, which was the design firm that did the design of stores. He said the, the, he said the financial position of Apple is so precarious that if that hadn't worked, it would have taken Apple down. So, awesome innovation, but really high risk. Which gives rise to the obvious question, is there a way that we can do smaller experiments, less risk, less expensive, that gives us a, a more scientific way uh, to get to, to innovative solutions. And we think there is. And we call it disciplined experimentation. 
So again, we're using the scientific method, we're conducting experiments, but we're doing it in a disciplined way. And a lot of this thinking is explained by a guy named Eric Reese in the Lean Startup. People can show our hands, people have heard about that book. Yeah, a lot, of people, a lot of people have heard about it. So Eric Reese was an agile software developer. He was a serial failure in Silicon Valley. He had two failed startups. He almost had a third, and they turned it around in the middle, which he explains in the book. And he had to ask himself the question, what did we do different the third time? What did I learn as a result of these, these failures and successes in, in the startup world? And really, it was three simple ideas. I would encourage you to read the book, but if you don't want to tell you three key points. The concept of the minimum viable product. What is the smallest thing I could possibly do and build that I could get a customer paying me some money for? But most, perhaps more importantly, I could learn from their feedback. I could start learning about what they wanted. Get it out there as fast as possible, whatever like. It could be a prototype. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles. Get a prototype out there as quickly as you can so that you can learn more. You've got to get more feedback. You start adding on more features and benefits that you see what the feedback is. And then keep iterating. Just keep doing the, the, the right thing. If, it, if, it, if it's not working, change, pivot, do something different. At least you're, if you're out there early and you're prototyping, you're getting that feedback as to whether or not. You know, he says, like on the third product he had that almost failed, he was the CTO of the company. He said, like, I personally wrote 140,000 lines of code and found out that nobody would even take one of it. It's a free download. I could have written one web page and found that out. So, yeah, this idea of developing the minimal, minimum viable product, get it out there quickly and learn as you get the customer reaction, much less risky way that drives innovation. And in the last couple of years, Eric's a friend of ours, in the last couple of years, we've been working a lot with our customers to get them into the cycle of burn, uh, build, measure, and learn. Build, measure, and learn. And just keep that iterative process going so that you get better at it. It turns out, I'm not going to read the quote for you, you all can read. Learning and innovation tend to go hand in hand. So this is a framework that we've come up with that we use with a lot of our clients called a customer-centric, because again, we're keeping the customer at the center of our vision, a customer-centric digital innovation framework. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how it works. Um, Ideas. The world is not short of ideas. If you would empower them and unleash them, your own employees have a lot of ideas. Except most of them are stifled. They'll feel like they can, they can elevate their ideas to the executive level. Um, so, but if you empower them, they're going to have a lot of ideas. There's also externally sourced ideas. You know, too many companies are only blinkered to their own industry. They know what other, if they're a bank, they know what other banks are doing. If they're a media company, they know what other, other media companies are doing. But some of the rich lesson you can learn is looking at a completely different industry and seeing what they're doing and, and importing those ideas into your business. Or look at your competitors. It's okay to steal ideas. Um, then you want to put those ideas through some kind of filter. Um, you know, not all ideas are good ideas. And so I usually tell my clients, uh, if it's going to cost $8 billion or require rewriting the laws of physics, maybe we'll park that for a while. But if you think it's an interesting idea and you'd like to tease it out a little further, we can get down into that filter into what we call this continuous design, continuous delivery, iterative process. And we've written books uh, on, and both on continuous design and on continuous delivery, and I'm sure the folks from Knowledge Brazil will be happy to give you a copy. Um, and the intellectual fuel that we pour in to help drive that iterative process around faster and faster is a combination of design thinking and systems thinking. Design thinking, don't design anything that your customer is not going to find useful, usable, and desirable. Now, forget your preconceptions. Test those ideas and those designs out with real customers and find out if they would like to use them. And systems thinking. Again, from your customer's point of view, what's every step, create values for what values for your maps. What's every step in the process that you go through, including your supply chain, like have the products and services you buy and provide those services to your customers. Map out every step every string in that process, and then say, what, is there any part, any step in there that your customer doesn't value and isn't willing to pay you money for? for? From his or her point of view, the customer's point of view, that's waste. Get rid of it. It's not helping you. It's just costing you money, and it's not something that they value. So out of that iterative uh, design and delivery process, we generate multiple minimum viable products, which we can now test in the marketplace. And typically, we're doing that with our clients in a few weeks, not a few months. 
and $1,400,000, not a few million dollars. Um, so we go out there, we test those with real customers. If they don't get traction, kill them. Have the courage to fail fast. Kill them off. You haven't spent a lot of money. The ones that look like they're really getting traction, then you've got solid data. So instead of guessing, or the way I can tell you, the way a lot of innovation decisions get made in big companies now, is the hippo makes the decision. And the hippo is the highest paid person in the room. And based on what he guesses, he makes the decision for the investment and the innovation investment dollar is going to go. That doesn't work. 80% of products and services fail within three years. This gives you real solid data to make your decision on what you want to make for the investment. So I just want to um, end up here uh, by giving you a couple examples uh, of work that we've done in class where we use this kind of technique. So lastminute.com is a UK company. They're part of the, uh, the global um, Travelocity brand. They can love different brands around the world, Suji and Asia. Uh, and last minute, their business is selling uh, last minute accommodation, last minute tour, uh, tours, uh, car rentals, distressed inventory. Um, their problem is mobile search. So the research is showing them that over 40% of the searches in the UK for last minute accommodation in particular were being done on mobile phones. Their mobile apps are about five years old, they don't suck. Um, but, so they knew they needed to work on that, but they really didn't know the answer to the question what would be the killer application? or the killer features on an application for mobile search. So they, they brought us in, and we decided the first thing we did was we set up a pop-up design studio right smack in the middle of a, the lobby of a hotel in the west end of London. There were about 800 customers going through that hotel every day. And about 400 of them, almost half, were registered uh, members of LastMinute.com. They got about 2 million registered members in Metropolitan London. And they were very happy to stop and look at prototypes and sketches and, and give us their reaction to what, uh, what their ideas might be. In four days, we generated 80 actionable ideas, 80 ideas that looked like they had potential. And we analyzed, and we had prototyped three possible solutions that we could actually show people. So I just want to show you a little video of what that looked like. And I, I've got to warn you, uh, if you think my accent's hard to follow, there are so many weird British accents in the next one minute video, it's a little hard to follow. Fairly. So probably the key takeaway there was the product manager was the guy in the beard saying, um, we got more feedback in one day than we would normally get in a month. You know, get out of the office, get in with your customers, and actually test with them what they like. Um, these are the results. So this was launched in February, uh, sorry, November of last year without any advertising. And within one month, orders have increased by almost 100%. Conversion had increased, like how many people actually bought the city doing research is going away. Conversion increased by almost 125%, and total order value, bottom line profit result, almost 150%. And that's about in the end of time. Pretty, pretty phenomenal results. Uh, this is an Australian company. Woolworths is a brand that means different things in different countries around the world. In Australia, it's grocery. So the largest grocery retailer, over 800 stores in Australia. They've got, in addition to that, about 200 liquor stores, about 200 pubs. Um, they have a general merchandising business that has their own store, so they're a huge retailer. Um, they, last year, they launched four concept stores. They're small format stores. They're not full service, you know, everything. They got um, barista coffee. They want people to stop when they work long. You can get a coffee. They've got gourmet lunches. And, you, and it, also, you might stop in and pick up a, a, an item or two on your way home from work. What they were, the problem they were trying to solve, though, is how do they put together meal solutions, or meal, what they call meal deals. 
So if you can just pick up one or two things, you might actually pick up four or five or six, so they keep getting into your shared wallet. So we ran a similar kind of experiment um, in this one of their small concept stores, and So, just to summarize, um, we know that innovation is hard for big organizations, but there are ways of getting better at that. Um, you know, everybody wants to create a, a culture of innovation in the company, but you can't do that overnight. You know, you've got to have somewhere to start. So we're suggesting that you can you can start in you know, pick one area. Run some experiments, maybe set up an innovation lab. Prototype things rapidly, get them out. We saw that you know, a solution we created in five days. Um, Start getting real user feedback so that you then make better informed data-driven investment decisions for the problem one of the serious money behind. Uh, now I know not many of you are CEOs, 
But if you take these ideas back to your organization and start filtering them in and talking to people about better ways that we can get at looking at our, our business model, thinking about the way we manage people and how we develop new products and services, I think you'll be you'll be change agents in your businesses. Um, finally, just a few a few final thoughts that are kind of one step removed uh, from the, the topic we've been talking about today, but I thought we would like enough that I wanted to share them with you. One is um, are we looking at the end of American hegemony in management thinking? Julian Birkenshaw teaches at the London Business School. He's a collaborator with Jerry Hamill at Harvard. And they, they put out this publication called MLAB, Management Lab Notes. And he wrote this article back in January 2012 where he predicted that for 100 years, let's face it, the thinking in American business schools has dominated business thinking. You can count the number of, uh, of global business leaders who didn't at least attend some of an American business school on the hands, on, on the fingers of, of both hands. That's going to change. As the locus, and we think it's a good thing, actually, I mentioned before, that Wall Street's emphasis on short-term profits almost at the exclusion of anything else has not only wrecked a lot of American companies, but it led to the global financial crisis, which brought the world's financial system to its knees in 2008, and many economies are still struggling to recover from. But as the locus of world economic growth is shifting away from the United States to Western Europe and towards the global south, which is where we're putting a lot of our emphasis as a global company, we think the possibility exists for new and better ways of thinking about managing our companies. The next slide is kind of a continuation. Oops, one slide. <laughs> this one is. At the height of the global financial crisis in 2008, George Soros, the international financier, made a very related point to the last slide, where he said, look, there's two things about the global financial crisis that are indisputable. One, it's the worst economic crisis global, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, no doubt about that. But two, 65 years of world economic growth based on the American economy is over. There is no engine left in the American economy that could lead, lead to that again. Um, and you see that in today's data. Of the 20 fast, world's fastest growing economies, none of them are in the Western Hemisphere. They're all in the global south, which results in that. And, and innovation in the global south is going to be different. It's going to be more driven by constraints. Consider the fact that in India, most of rural India doesn't have electricity. So we did a project there about a year ago with a company that wanted to provide low-cost solar power to rural uh, uh, villages. And in 12 weeks, we developed a solution where a, a villager could, uh, or a, a, somebody in a farm could walk into their local village, make a small deposit, they don't have a lot of money, uh, pick up a, uh, a, a solar power device, get an SMS code on their feature phones, they don't have smartphones, uh, they, they, they could feed in and turn that solar device uh, on when they got back to their home. Five months a month, they could go back in, make a pay a the deposit, get another SMS code to, to power that thing up. Uh, in Africa, most people don't, the, most people don't have electricity, but the GSM network for feature phones exceeds the coverage of the electricity grid. So a lot of solutions in Africa are going to be driven by how to make a feature phone capable of being a, a smart communication device. So the point is that innovation is often driven by constraints. And you know that actually shouldn't surprise us too much. Just think about Google or Facebook or Twitter. What do they all have in common? They were started by students. Students have a lot of constraints, not least the most important, which is they don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what is not constrained is their thinking, which is what allows innovation to happen. So, Jugat Innovation is a book, uh, I don't know, some guys in India. Jugat is the Hindi word for constraint. And it's a, the whole book is an argument about how um, innovation in the global south is going to be driven by different factors than growth in the global north, and hopefully with better results. And my last point here is going to be that big data is not your, always your friend. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz in the industry. You guys probably heard all about it. You know, there's this explosion of devices that are all connected on the Internet, the Internet of Things. Uh, an enormous opportunity for companies to find out every last little minute detail about where you go, what you do, what you're looking for, what you're searching for, who you're calling, all of that. That's not necessarily a good thing. So... Show of hands, tell me what those are, pictures are. NSA, spot on. So the NSA data center just constructed in uh, Utah um, with the amount of data doubling every year in the world, they figured they have enough storage capacity to store the entirety of the world's data 
for the next hundred years. The problem they had was they built it with such speed and it's kind of sort of shabby construction problems that their spot fire's not breaking out everywhere. It'd be a real shame if the place burned down. <laughs> and then there's the National Security Headquarters in, um, in uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. Interestingly enough, both of them are behind wire on military installations. And, you know, the promise of Internet technologies that got a lot of us involved in this industry and got us excited about the possibility of Internet technologies democratizing things and making things more equal and enabling a kid in Sao Paulo or in Mumbai in India or in Cape Town, South Africa, just as capable of creating Internet business as somebody's in, in New York or London, um, that promise of the Internet can turn out with dastardly results in the hands of the bad guys, the regulation security agency. So don't think that the internet and big data is always your friend. And with that, I just want to say thank you. Uh, my detail structure, I, I think I put up the wrong version of this because I'm supposed to have Claudia Bellows and Alexei Zorti in the back there. So um, but anyway, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get me at, at, at that email address and I'll certainly I heard about uh, the genius bar at Apple and Retail stores. Uh, like uh, the, uh, before uh, they before it was created, uh, so what they did was kind of a lab. A lab. They took people to the, uh, they took some people to the hands hotels, uh, uh, hotels five star and so on. And that was quite interesting because when you Go to a hotel, five stars, you ask for help, and they provide you help immediately. And that's what's like what Genius Bar is, for example. And a retail store is like a different store, went there, and it's like. Yeah, the other, the, there is a real interesting point about employee motivation, because I, I use a Dan Pink story about, you know, um, employees that are motivated by. Um, you know, master economy and purpose, and, and, and that's what, I mean, Apple only pays those people in North America about $12 an hour, uh, which, you know, it's not a huge wage, um, but those kids are fired up, you know, they know all about those products, they're excited to work for Apple, and you get a customer experience that other retailers would die for, and so that idea of how, you know, how do you recruit a workforce and, and, and incentive them to get them excited about the products, even if you're not, it's not about the money, well, you know, it's, I mean, the Apple is probably paying more, but um, they've been able to create a culture inside the, the Apple stores that are exciting to want to work there. So it's an interesting example. Uh, regarding uh, large corporations and experience with them, uh, regarding outsourcing and TI, what's, what's your opinion? I, I think that the pendulum is starting to swing back the other way. Um, so outsourcing in the, in the after the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s, that's when outsourcing really took off. And there was kind of an attitude that IT is a commodity. Uh, just you know, look, everybody, you know, anybody can do IT. Let's just ship it to the cheapest place in the world and we can find people know how to do it. Um, that didn't work so well for a lot of a lot of organizations, and now they're starting to bring at least some of that back in house, or they're looking for better offshore vendors. Because it turns out, you know, the, all the old books in our industry, like Peopleware and Invisible Man Month, say the difference between an average developer and a, a really hot, a, a crash hot developer is a factor of about one in ten. So picking the right person out seems to become very important, but. I think also the idea that we, we let too much of our intellectual capital go, and we're going to have to rebuild that in house is also something that a lot of companies are. are uh, and that IT is not just a commodity. I mean, I'll give you all those stats at the beginning about how important IT is as a driver of this 
increasing speed of change in business. And it's that important, you better be able to know about it and, and have knowledge and, and experience inside your own company. So I, I think it's, it should, it's kind of going back the other way. I mean, there's another factor on, though, which is uh, the last statistic I saw was that India and China are graduating about a million engineers a year. About 70,000 are graduating out of Western Europe and the United States combined. So in another five years, and, and, and if wage inflation in those two countries in particular is going through the roof, it's like 15 to 40 percent a year. So in another five years, the labor arbitrage factor for sending work offshore is going to go away. And you will instead consider offshoring because that's where the talent is. You know, I've got to find Brazilian developers for my North American products because there just aren't enough smart developers left in the, you know, in the United States for the scale in which I need to operate. So, I think the companies will both try to find better and smarter people to outsource to that are in this high quality software. Uh, will 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 bring some of the intellectual property uh, back inside the house because managing that technology is just too important. To the future. Uh, in terms of the uh, technology that you your talent power. <laughs> so you know, what I said was the really smart people are not going to put up with those hierarchical, you know, all the orders come from the top. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody, does anybody here work for emphasis? Okay, so if you work for emphasis in India, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand people. The, the poor schmo at the bottom of it, down to the cubicle farm, you know, can hack out the code, he has no, he's no, the orders for what he's supposed to be doing have been handed down through 26 layers of management above him. He's completely removed from the customer. He has no idea what the function that he's working on is actually going to do to the end customer. So, you know, I think as, as the opportunities for people to say, I'm not going to work in an environment like that. Like, I'm a smart person. You know, I, I got choices in life. Um, and knowledge workers do. You know, you, you have talent power that you can exercise. And it may take you a while out there in the marketplace there. You know, shop around a little bit and, and find out is this a place where employees are empowered? Where if I've got an idea, I, I have the ability to execute against it. Is, a, is it a place where management is open and porous and are there mechanisms for me to keep those ideas in? If they aren't, go find someplace else. Because the, the smart people are going to get out of those departments and they're where they can sell. All right. Um, so we there are some very competitive markets, like beer market or soft drinks market. And let's suppose, like, PepsiCo is going to launch a new flavor for soda, uh, but she does not want Coca-Cola to do the same. Otherwise, she'll just they'll just copy, and then she'll just lose this advantage they have. So, how is it possible for PepsiCo to launch an MVP or do all these um, lean startup model? Uh, to build a product without Coca-Cola finds finding it and then just copy it. Is that possible or just not? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, it kind of up the story about New Coke. And I don't know if people remember that one, but there was an example of a spectacular failure. So Coke is the most valued brand in the world. It's like worth billions of dollars. Just that, 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 used that brand. Used to be. Used to be. Used to be. Used to be. Uh, it's still a very powerful brand. Uh, and a number of years ago, they brought out, they, and they spent years working on this. It's thing that's called New Coke. And they were going to retire the old Coke because they've done all this testing and all this research. They know the new Coke's going to take over. The market, the customers rebelled. I mean, they had, to, they had to pull the new Coke off the market and go back to the old because the power of the brain was so, was so powerful. Um, Starbucks has the same problem. Um, you know, they're so closely associated with coffee. Uh, and, and high premium price coffee has a lot more sugar in it than someplace else. But that brand is not very elastic, and it's not kind of hard to do something else. I mean, it's got sandwiches and stuff, but it's really hard for them, for them to change the brand very much, at least on the same brand. So I think the opportunities are there, but they're probably in diversification. You know, so Coke is now buying up, and, and PepsiCo is too, buying up food restaurants and uh, go 
started getting into natural mineral waters and a lot, lots of other things that aren't just a fizzy drink of sugar in it or not. In it. So I, I think the opportunity is more around for those kind of brands, diversification and rethinking the business model. You know, we're not just, we don't have to just be a purvey or fizzy sweet drinks. You know, we, we can get into whole new other businesses. And then, you know, they got the financial part of the deal. So you don't, you don't have to, it's like newspapers. Get over being a newspaper. You think about how you can refashion. Like the New York Times is one of the clients, and we're engaged with them right now on how they've got hundred, you know, 150 years of rich content uh, that, no, that, that they have trademarked and got copyright on it. How can they repurpose that uh, and represent it maybe as books or magazines or picture journals or something other than just a newspaper um, so that they can become a different kind of business? And I think that's. For, for some of these companies that are so great as a, as a, as a, a beverage company, you know, they're going to have to think of a different business models and different areas that they can do so that they're a, you know, a joy producing company or a, a, a healthy company. All right. All right. Thanks. I don't know how much time we want, so I'm going to give the guy my YouTube folks. You have no more questions? So, do you have any other questions? No. So, thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot.